Hello class, uh, this will be part two of Path of the Apache, and we'll begin right where we left off with the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act, or IRA. This is also known as the Wheeler-Howard Act, uh, but these acts all restored a measure of self-government and religious freedom to the Apache uh, over the years, and uh, these acts included the Indian Claims Commission Act of 1946, the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1966, the Indian Self-Determination and Educational Assistance Act of 1975, and then finally in 1978, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Uh, speaking to their religion, uh, their spiritual beliefs are founded uh, strongly in ideas of animism and uh, reverence for the natural world. They depend on the earth for their survival and in turn they honor and respect the land. They also believe that they're surrounded by supernatural powers and that everything has a spirit, whether it be the mountain, the trees, the stars, or animals. So when one of their fellow tribe members dies, they'll actually burn most of their belongings and uh, burn their, their wiki up. And they do this to prevent that departed spirit from returning to the earth and becoming lost. So uh, again, their, their lives are rooted deeply in spiritual practice um, and song and dance. Uh, they use that to different, uh, different dances to communicate with their creator, different songs. So other aspects of their religion include uh, ceremonial dancing, drum circles, sweat lodges, and uh, these are all key elements of the Apache religion and rites of passage. Moving on to the intergovernmental relations and war. Aside from probably the Comanche, the Apaches are, are known to be some of the fiercest uh, warriors in resistance to the American government and the U.S. Cavalry. They were experts in field craft, strategic planning, and war fighting. They knew how to um, adapt to the U.S. Cavalry's different tactics and use the terrain to their advantage. Um, if they weren't fighting the Spanish, uh, or Mexico or the United States, they were fighting other rival tribes, and this developed into a warrior culture for the Apache. Again, they uh, they went to war with the Spanish in the 1600s. Uh, many of them were forced into slavery. Um, they went to war with Mexico in 1831, where they actually were allied with the United States. And by 1880, they were at war with the United States for land, and uh, they put up a strong resistance for a long time um, using guerrilla tactics and uh, against the U.S. Cavalry's much larger forces. But eventually by 1890, they were all forced onto different reservations. And many of these reservations, many Apache, well, they still refer to them as prisoner of war camps. Uh, but there is some progress that's been made politically and governmentally they have gained a little bit more tribal sovereignty as a result of those acts that we spoke about earlier, and in particular the the uh, Wheeler Howard Act of 1934. But as far as the Apache is concerned, they uh, uh, when the the U.S. government just really just has a long history of uh, violent oppression and breaking their peace treaties. So there's Apaches like uh, Mangus Coloradus, who you can see here. Uh, Geronimo, Cochise, they've all made attempts at peace, although it's, uh, most of the time these peace treaties just ended in their own capture or brutal death. Uh, Mangus, Colorado, for one, was lured into peace talks uh, where he was just arrested and then tortured with, uh, with hot bayonets and uh, finally killed. They beheaded him, and there was a phrenologist who worked for the Smithsonian who asked that... Uh, his head be sent to him. So they boiled it and shipped it off to the Smithsonian where they still don't know where it is. You can see the illustration from the examiner or the phrenologist right here. But Mangus Coloradus was said to be six foot six and just, you know, staunch and a uh, uh, rather formidable opponent in war. And I think that's maybe another reason why they wanted his skull as kind of like a war trophy. But you can see him here. Again, he was uh, one of their greatest leaders, and uh, Cochise was his son. And his and his this beheading um, 
uh, along with Geronimo, Geronimo's head was stolen from his grave, but these are considered like huge crimes against uh, them. Uh, they believe that they're wandering in the afterlife without their head. So this was one of the worst things that could happen to, to these Apaches. Um, but uh, this is uh, uh, these different phases of Geronimo's life, I thought captured uh, the Apache tribe rather well. Uh, they went from nomadic hunters and gatherers to a tribe that was forced off their land and forced to fight to ones that were eventually uh, hunted down and captured and subjugated, forced onto reservations, and then finally their culture just being patronized and commercialized. Into the uh, 20th century now, um, the Manhattan Project, I think most people know what that was, the development of nuclear weapons prior to World War II or during World War II. Um, but a lot of people don't realize the impact that it did have on Apaches uh, among other tribes. In the 1940s, the U.S. government took uh, land in uh, northwestern New Mexico from several different uh, Apache tribes, being the Mescalero and the Hikaria. Um, and they developed this land for nuclear weapons testing. This land uh, covered from Dolce, New Mexico, down to Los Alamos, which is now home to the Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is a, a test range for different types of uh, weapons and missiles. And many of them are uh, use uh, radioactive materials or hazardous materials like depleted uranium. And some of this nuclear fallout, of course, is um, radioactive. And so it's leaked into the ground and the air and the water in the local area. And over the last few decades, there's been unusually high rates of thyroid cancer in many Native American communities. Then uh, in 1967, there's a company called um, El Paso Natural Gas Company that started something called Project Gas Buggy, which was kind of a fracking enterprise for natural gas. They 